I think the panel that uh, Daryl and the folks here at the business school uh, have put together have a broad cross-section of new responsibilities, but let me tell you two things about them. They were all, myself included, once uh, working at central banks. So in spite of their experiences in the private sector they're in, you will find a central bank sort of background and ethos to this group. But the second thing I'll tell you about this group might surprise you. Uh, these guys all want to fight with each other. <laughs> so we're going to try to have a lively, lively debate. I think the discussion we had this morning that David led us through, uh, that Mark talked about, began at the immediate topic of bank capital and bank liquidity. Let me try to put that in a slightly broader context to engage the discussion here. Uh, by making four points. Uh, first, the financial architecture is in substantial flux. And I think in Washington, at least, we have a tendency to hear a statement like that and say, ah, yes, that's because the rules of the road, the regulation is in flux. And I think that's part of it. Myron Scholes and I uh, had a discussion with students yesterday. And I think the point that both of us tried to make is not only are the rules of the road in flux, but the reaction function of financial services firms are in some sense unknown and unknowable. And in order to get this all right, not only do the rules have to be clear, but the understanding of what that means for banks and other financial services firms on a global basis has to be understood so that the right things can be done for the global economy. So it is this uncomfortable iteration that I would say we're in the early, early parts of. Uh, the business of banking is at an inflection point. I think some of the questions that are in some ways in the air here include will the banks at the top become utilities to one extent or not? Second, will those banks be in a different tier? Will they have a different competitive environment, a different group of competitors than the other 9,000 financial institutions in the US? Or, in fact, if we think of the largest banks, the next tier, think of those as regional banks, and the next tier, think of those as community banks, will those borders among those tiers be permeous? Will they be porous? Will they be permeable? Will those that are at the top fall? Or will the same institutions that are at the top today remain there forevermore? I think the implications of that question are likely to have big consequences, not just for regulation, but uh, for the broader economy. Are banks special? We have a tendency in central bank uh, language to talk about the banking industry. And the theory of that always was that somehow banks are special. They take retail deposits and they do special things. But the discussion that Mark led you through on Basel suggests that maybe it is financial services firms and the specialness might not be their ability to take deposits, but it might be whether they are in the language of the moment systemically important. And I think the other implication of that is our firms that are outside the formal banking sector who might think that they're not going to be subjected to these rules, is that the uh, direction that the world is going? So the capital and liquidity discussions that we're having today strike me as being indicative, illustrative of some of these uh, bro broader developments. Second, let me just briefly try to define what we're talking about in capital and liquidity. I think David and Mark did a, did a good job of that this morning. But at some level, I think I would say capital is a kind of insurance. Capital should be what absorbs losses that are unanticipated. It's the role of capital in these uh, financial structures. And I think what surprised many of us in the central bank and regulatory community in the crisis is that there was a lot of capital, at least by regulatory standards, but it didn't seem prepared to absorb losses. And the question really is whether that should count as capital going forward. Second, we had a bit of a discussion this morning about what is liquidity. And uh, while I think we can talk about liquidity as the grease that helps the engine run, I think the reality, at least for those of us that were hanging around in the darkest days of the crisis, is separating capital and liquidity as much as we can in some academic textbook prove difficult. So keeping those definitions separate and understanding when they conflate in periods of distress is useful. Uh, third framing point um, is that we tend to talk in forums like this and uh, analysts that cover the banks 
We tend to talk about levels of capital and liquidity from a regulator's perspective. I think we probably don't give enough time and attention to what the right levels of capital and liquidity are through the eyes of markets and market participants. And if you were to ask me about where the focus should be, I think there's no doubt that we need regulatory reforms, no doubt that we need greater clarity on what regulators expect capital and liquidity to be. But that shouldn't be to the detriment of what market participants demand of individual institutions. And if we end up in a world of capital and liquidity where regulators are the only ones setting the rules and market participants are yielding entirely to the great wisdom of us in the regulatory community, we will not have the kind of transparency and market functioning that we want. So I'd put a bit more uh, burden in our discussions on what do markets think the right capital and liquidity are for Bank X, for a institution with the following characteristics, and uh, those judgments ought to be taken into account when regulators do their job. And let me make a fourth and final framing question, and I think it's one that was made this morning, but I'd amplify it, and that is we have one imperfectly integrated global economy. We have one imperfectly integrated set of financial markets. And the idea that any of us, no matter how wise, no matter how rigorous our rules are, that any of our <laughs> banks or financial institutions, or our economies for that matter, are somehow isolated to the rest of the world is an error. I think uh, many of us uh, that served at the Fed over the course of the last several years uh, feel good about one thing in particular, and that is maybe a little bit at our behest. In aggregate, the US banking system has recapitalized itself. Now, it may be that firms would have recapitalized if they weren't pushed a little bit by their regulators. But I think all in all, we have to feel pretty good about the massive recapitalization of our banking system. Doesn't mean that the capital levels are exactly right for everybody. But we've got a couple hundred billion dollars of new common equity that should make central bankers sleep a little bit easier in the US. And I think an open question is whether the rest of the world should feel as comfortable about the recapitalization of their banking sectors. I think the question was raised this morning about whether, in fact, they need to raise all this capital after all, after all. Because if the sovereign is prepared to stand behind them, there's a difficult and important question whether the capital requirements of them should be similar. Huge implications of this for the global economy. So with those uh, four framing points, let me first turn to Adrian and uh, give him the allotted 10 minutes. We'll go around the horn this way and open it up to questions. Adrian. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, I, I have to say I was uh, threatened with physical violence by uh, one member sitting on this panel here, uh, and I, I just want him to know that uh, we Australians uh, always travel with a boomerang in our brief briefcase, and so <laughs> I'm happy to run for it if I have to. So. Um, I, I guess uh, in terms of the, um, the talk uh, that I wanted to give, oh, I love this picture, you know, the, um, it was really about a, a river where <laughs> where the bank was collapsing, but I just couldn't resist uh, sticking it in there. Uh, the, um, I, I guess, you know, we, we're, we've done a lot of things on Dodd-Frank, we've done a lot of things on, uh, on, on Basel. Uh, the G sci-fi issue um, is still uh, global um, systemically important financial institutions, is still uh, uh, something that we're discussing at the Financial Stability Board and so on. Actually, uh, given what was said by the Fed official this morning, I should say the same thing. These are, these are my views and not the Financial Stability Board's views or uh, or the OECD's views. Uh, I, I guess the um, I guess the feeling that I have though is that uh, uh, that a little bit different to the introduction. I, I think that uh, the, one of the problems with our regulation has been that it's been too far uh, th seen through the eyes of private sector participants uh, and not enough uh, imposed on them. Uh, in and I'll show you uh, some of the reasons why I think that. Now I've got to move quickly given the ten minutes. What I want to show you here, though, is just uh, um, uh, uh, derivatives. Uh, th this is gross notional derivatives and what I call in the grey bar primary assets. Now, that's the thing that actually finance the economy. Remember, derivatives don't finance anything. They just shift things around, uh, whereas uh, equities, uh, securities, uh, banks and so on, they're actually funding growth and investment and the like. That's the grey bar. And you see there, back in 1998, uh, um, primary assets or primary securities were about two times world GDP. Well, pretty much. Over this period, they stayed two times world GDP. Uh, you have a look at, uh, you have a look at uh, derivatives with the, uh, the dotted line there, three times world GDP, getting up to the crisis just before, uh, 12 times GDP, bit of a setback, and, uh, and we're running around 10 times GDP at the moment. 
Uh, the primary assets, well, the banking ones have been on this steady uptrend uh, in terms of the, uh, the black line there. Uh, the equity market, well, you can see the effects of 2008 on what happened to equity market capitalizations. Uh, and you see there are debt securities. Uh, and of course, in the uh, derivatives, I, I love this chart because if you look at that bottom line, the, the gray one, the, the CDS, uh, you know, like I sometimes show that chart on its own and it's a very spectacular chart building up to sort of 60 trillion uh, and then halving and, and we know that CDS uh, uh, played such a big role in the crisis, but, uh, but, but that ain't nothing compared to the mountain of interest rate derivatives out there. The, um, now, this, what I wanted to do is, I, I, I'm, I apologise for rushing, but what I wanted to do is, because a lot of things are going on here today, maybe we can leave it to question time, but a lot of things are going on in terms of shifting uh, derivatives, uh, standardised derivatives onto exchanges uh, where they might be better, uh, um, better uh, in terms of clearing, uh, clearing platforms where they might be better uh, uh, margined and so on, uh, compared to the, uh, the fairly sort of grey area of what happens uh, uh, at, at the moment. Uh, what, what you see here, though, is um, uh, for those of you who don't know what a Hurthandel index is, it's a, it's a measure of concentration. And the typical pattern you see, I, I don't do it for all the derivatives, I, ha I have done so, but, but you see here what happens is you get a uh, um, um, concentration was building up in the early 1990s, then you get this big fall away as everybody rushed in uh, in terms of, for example, into CDOs and, uh, and derivatives and so on. And so entry happened in the market, drives down margins. The UBS story is a very good example of that then of course a lot of people have to exit the industry and concentration rises again. When you think about concentration and moving things on to uh, clearing houses, that concentration uh, is going to be a factor and these global uh, systemically important financial institutions are, are, are basically investing in these clearing houses uh, and will have a, a big say on that. Uh, now, I won't I'll just quickly move to say to the last one here because I want to make sure I stay within my 10. But when you take that Herfindahl index number, uh, what this basically shows you is, um, maybe I'll show the previous one. Uh, the, um, what you see here is that you can convert that Herfindahl index picture of concentration into the number of banks that if they had the same uh, share, how many banks would be serving that market. So if you look on the far right hand side, for example, you'll see that uh, with, uh, with uh, the, the black line, for example, US, in the US dollar market, uh, options, interest rate options, uh, essentially being served by only six firms. Uh, and you see there the, uh, the US swaps market uh, by about eight or nine firms and, and so on. And so that's how you interpret that thing. So these are very, uh, this is for the whole world, so these are very concentrated markets we're talking about. Now what's the problem with concentration uh, and, uh, and the way OTC derivatives work? Well, as we all know in this room, uh, pricing and the valuing of these things is very difficult, but it certainly depends on a diversity of views. The more concentrated you become, the less diverse those views are, the more inefficient pricing is. And as concentration rises, in particular since Basel has nothing to say about uh, concentration, it doesn't penalise concentration, uh, we have uh, concerns about these developments in concentration. Um, these are just explanations of the barriers to entry uh, that cause uh, this concentration. I, 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 won't, uh, I won't go into that because of the 10 minutes. How am I doing, Chief? Have I got halfway through? Okay, um, there's that slide again on the collapsing banks. <laughs> now what I wanted to do is just briefly then come to the, um, uh, to the issue of, the, of capital and the, and the Basel requirements. Because for me personally, uh, I think the biggest problem, and when you read the bank's comments on Basel 1, 2 and 3 all through the process here, you always see a similar pattern. Don't mess with our definition of what we think is capital. Uh, don't talk about leverage ratios. Don't try and discuss netting, uh, any problems with netting derivatives. We don't, we don't want you to worry about any of that. But we love risk-weighted assets. We just love that. We think the Basel tier ratio is very good. We're happy to work with uh, uh, the BSCSB uh, with, uh, with regard to that. And of course, uh, uh, they would say that, wouldn't they? Uh, because uh, in my view, um, I'll skip netting and go, um, or just to give you an I, I love this slide and it was my question to the Goldman today. today. He seemed to reply, by the way, I don't know if he's still here, that uh, these are the, uh, when, um, uh, just to show you the importance of getting this right, when AIG failed, these were the payments, uh, you can see there in the second last column, these were the payments that were made by, uh, to everyone who's a US citizen in this room by your government uh, to settle the positions of uh, these banks. Uh, you notice there that, by the way, a majority, a majority of that money went to foreign banks. So a, a, a majority of the money paid by the US to save IG actually went to foreign banks. Now, this, the answer I got about the 12.9 from Goldman's, 12.9 billion that they received that they, they didn't really need it. I guess that implies that closeout netting didn't apply in the case of uh, the failure of AIG. I, I suppose that must be true given what he said. But normally what would happen is you'd be settling net positions in a closeout. And so those, as I understood it, were the net positions. And you can see how big they are. But the key point on the right-hand side, 
uh, 29, 30, in the case of Deutsche Bank, 37% of their equity less goodwill was paid to them as capital. The alternative position, had AIG been allowed to fail, what would have happened to those, uh, what would have happened to those banks? They would have been losses taken to the bottom line uh, and that would have become a, a problem for all of the, uh, the global financial system. So now I want to come to the question of uh, um, um, uh, Basel to finish. The, the, the way Basel works is it defines uh, risk-weighted assets up the top there, uh, uh, you know, grossing up the uh, uh, operational and market risk and then doing the sum of the, uh, of the, of the weighted assets. Now, the problem, with, uh, the problem with the Basel system is that Basel has nothing to say about the ratio of risk-weighted assets to total assets. So if I could just use a reductio ad absurdum sort of point, uh, if you were able to use derivatives and, and the way you arrange your portfolios to get your risk-weighted assets down to one euro in the case of a European bank, which technically you could, uh, then you'd be asked to hold 7% uh, of one euro, uh, uh, you know, so seven cents, and that could be your capital for a two trillion euro balance sheet. That's a, a ridiculous example, but that's literally, there's nothing to stop that from happening. So what banks do uh, in, is they uh, actually uh, can incorporate the way they use derivatives and the way they choose their portfolio uh, to minimise the amount of risk-weighted capital that they have uh, and therefore to, uh, uh, because the, the multiple of, to, to, to calculate that capital, the multiple is of risk-weighted assets. So if you don't believe me, two I just want to show you the, uh, two minutes. I just want to show you this, uh, maybe I'll just finish with these last two slides. This just shows you uh, on the left hand side there, the leverage of the bank shown, Deutsche Bank, BNP, these are mainly European banks. Uh, you see there when Basel II was introduced, remember that was supposed to make things tougher after Basel I. Now you see what happened is that um, uh, when Basel II was introduced, the leverage of these banks actually accelerated. It didn't, it didn't decelerate, it accelerated. And if you look on the right hand side there, you'll see the uh, ratio of risk weighted assets to total assets for those banks concerned. Banks can, at will, just reduce the ratio of risk weighted assets to total assets uh, by various uh, portfolio manipulations. And this shows you all of the banks, including US banks, uh, where you have risk weighted assets uh, versus total assets on the uh, vertical, and you have uh, the, uh, the leverage ratio on the, on the horizontal. And you just see there, they line up in a pretty linear fashion in terms of, uh, in terms of that ratio. Um, finally, uh, take me too long to go through that. Uh, the, the, um, I guess the, the effective policies the OECD has always supported have been uh, a leverage ratio based on no netting of derivatives, uh, a um, GC, G sci-fi levy, uh, which could apply uh, for, um, uh, on, on some concept of interdependence. You could take, uh, you could take uh, derivatives as an example. But the one that I favour and that we said very early on in the crisis was, uh, uh, what we, what, if you want to leave it up to the private sector, then, uh, um, which I think is the best way to do it, then make sure that you separate those entities, uh, that you have essentially like a Volcker rule for all actions with respect to uh, the interdependent sectors, in, in particular uh, swaps, derivatives and so on, that if we make those separate, then even as things move on to clearing houses and so on, we'll be very sure that when people deal with each other, they know they don't have access to too big to fail, to implicit or explicit guarantees from the government. Uh, they will have to basically be independently capitalised and you'll have the appropriate uh, spreads and, uh, and margining requirements that would follow from that, which would make those banks a much safer, much safer places to be. Perfect. Thank you very much, Adrian. Got a lot covered in 10 minutes. Let's turn to David, who's going to give us, I think, a perspective from Moody's. Now, the rating agencies have been much discussed uh, during the crisis, and some have blamed the rating agencies for different parts of it. There hasn't seemed to have been a counterbalance blame for those sophisticated investors who outsource their due diligence to rating agencies. And so I think David's got to take up some of the issues we discussed. What's the role of government support as Moody's thinks about ratings of financial institutions? What's the right capital and liquidity levels for these financial institutions, not just as set by regulators, but in Moody's independent judgment? So I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Kevin. And good morning, everyone. Um, I'd just start by thanking Daryl and the Stanford Finance Forum for inviting me here to participate in today's conference. It uh, definitely promises to be a lively day. Uh, I'm going to try to give an overview of how Moody's thoughts about bank capital and liquidity have evolved in response to the events of the crisis. And also try to, as best I can, represent the views of fixed income investors who are the main users of Moody's ratings and an important constituency for us. Before the financial crisis, generally speaking, capital and liquidity were given equal weight in our analysis 
with profitability and asset quality, and all such quantitative factors are given equal weight with qualitative factors such as franchise value, risk management, regulatory, and operating environment. Indeed, if anything, we probably tended to focus more heavily on profitability, especially relative to risk-weighted assets, and I'll get to that, as a key measure of bank credit risk, since stable and reliable profits can represent an important source of future capital. But during the crisis, this source of capital was not available for many banks, given the sizable uh, and, frankly, unexpected losses many banks suffered. We also observed that at the peak of the crisis in the fall of 2008, few, if any, banks were able to monetize what were arguably very strong franchises uh, through the issuance of new common equity. Um, the high degree of uncertainty among investors, as well as the reluctance of managements to acknowledge the severity of the crisis, certainly played a role in this. And to make matters worse, uh, Mark alluded to this, the tendency toward higher dividend payout ratios before the crisis, and the reluctance of bank managements to cut their dividends early in the crisis, meant that many banks were depleting their capital by paying out in dividends far more than they were earning. Indeed, we did a little study. For the US banking system, the amount of common dividends paid from the middle of 2007 to the end of 2008 was almost half of the amount of common equity which banks were subsequently forced to raise in 2009. In response to this, in early 2009, Moody's adopt, increased its focus on capital liquidity in its analysis of banks globally and adopted a more rigorous approach to scenario analysis and stress testing to assess how banks' capital liquidity would perform under both an expected case and um, one or more stressful scenarios. And this continues to be our focus to this day. As a result of this, we had a fairly significant number of rating downgrades uh, during the spring of 2009 on banks, mainly on their, more so on their standalone ratings, as Kevin alluded to, the support, e implicit support, much of which at that point had already become explicit, did provide something of a, a, a buffer, and so that debt and deposit ratings at that time did not fall as much, although we today see the gradual removal of support and the changes in resolution powers occurring in many countries continues to have downward impact pressure on bank ratings because we think those support assumptions that we sustained pre-crisis, that we increased during the crisis, um, are likely not to be sustainable post-crisis. Regarding liquidity, we've long viewed unsecured wholesale funding as notoriously unreliable, whether it be in the form of CP or wholesale deposits. Uh, the, um, our rating methodology has an explicit preference for banks with high levels of core deposits and liquid assets relative to wholesale funding. We've also looked for strong liquidity buffers and alternative sources of funding at any bank that's reliant on short-term unsecured funding. But prior to the crisis, we generally looked for sufficient liquidity or alternative funding sources so as to allow a bank to survive the loss of capital markets funding for up to a year. The crisis revealed that markets can remain shut for longer than that. And so we are now generally looking for larger liquidity buffers than we were pre-crisis. In this regard, we find that, generally speaking, the Basel liquidity proposals to be a very positive step for bank creditors. It creates, for the first time, actual liquidity requirements and something that is relatively uniform globally. Although we do fear that in the long time frame being considered for implementation, this could allow for these proposals to be watered down. Another assumption which the crisis challenged was the reliability of secured funding markets. Previously, we had considered secured wholesale funding as a more reliable and stable source of funding than unsecured wholesale funding, and indeed as a potential backstop for unsecured funding. Our view had been, had been, that while haircuts on such funding would likely increase in times of stress, the funding would still be available. But during the crisis, secured funding dried up almost quick, as quickly as unsecured funding for many issuers. This was particularly challenging, since prior to the crisis, many banks' trading portfolios had grown increasingly large, driven in part by a growing focus on originate-to-distribute business models. These enlarged trading portfolios were funded, at least partially, with short-term secured financing, such as repo. But in hindsight, much of that growth involved less liquid assets, or at least assets for which liquidity was a function solely of irrational exuberance. The reliance on short-term secured funding for less liquid assets proved to be a significant challenge for many banks. 
Our analysis of secured funding now focuses more closely on the liquidity and quality of the collateral banks are relying upon to secure funding, as well as the absolute level of illiquid assets in the trading book. We're also looking more closely at the term structure of bank secured funding, even if measured in weeks and months rather than in years. In a stress scenario, the difference between overnight repo funding and three month or six month repo funding can be the difference between an orderly unwind of positions and a fire sale with a resulting impairment to both capital and client confidence. Another revelation brought to light by the crisis was the extent to which Basel risk-weighted assets, either Basel I or Basel II, failed to provide a reliable indicator of a bank's riskiness, or the extent to which a bank might be expected to suffer greater losses relative to peers. This was most notably the case with the Basel market risk framework. Indeed, in hindsight, the growth in banks' trading books I alluded to a moment ago was no accident. Instead, it appears to have been a clear case of regulatory arbitrage, as banks took advantage of the fact that assets in the trading book attracted far lower risk weights than the same assets held in the banking book. In light of this, the revisions to the market risk framework under Basel II and a half and III are clearly positive for creditors, since they should align risk-weighted assets in the trading book, and thus regulatory capital, more closely with the actual risks a bank is taking. But frankly, the Basel Committee still faces a big credibility gap with investors. Risk-weighted assets remains a very opaque calculation to outside investors. Risk-weighted asset, uh, sorry, and that opacity, combined with its poor track record of predicting risk during the crisis, has led many investors to ignore it in favor of simpler balance sheet measures. Not that balance sheet measures are that much more transparent or comparable across firms. So at the end of the day, this opacity is driving many investors to demand a premium for investing in banks. Moody's continues to use risk-weighted assets in many of our analytic ratios. We are also increasingly looking at balance sheet leverage as an added metric. Balance sheet leverage not only provides a useful measure of the size of a bank's capital buffer against its liabilities, which, after all, are its obligations to its creditors, but can also be a useful measure of how vulnerable a bank may be to model risk. In other words, the risk that a bank's risk-weighted assets are understating its true risk. But with the opacity of banks' risk profiles is not limited to risk-weighted assets. For banks with significant capital markets activities, the degree of public disclosure by banks on their risk appetite and risk profile is still very limited. While most banks disclose VAR, the parameters wi vary widely from bank to bank. And furthermore, VAR, by its very formulation, provides no information about tail risks. So don't even get me started on trying to understand where a capital markets firm is making its profits. When most firms disclose a single line item for fixed income sales and trading revenues, it's pretty much impossible to know. So we still think banks face significant hurdles in terms of regaining market confidence. We think the uh, banks are highly leveraged, and frankly, much of the debate around the right capital ratio will still leave banks highly leveraged, um, reliant on confidence-sensitive funding. Um, and the tensions between equity holders and bank managers versus bondholders uh, the inherent asset concentrations of many banks um, it is difficult to avoid uh, and is not factored into most Basel measures. And the lack of transparency we find very challenging uh, and we think um, continues to make it very difficult to have confidence uh, in bank credit quality. Excellent. Th thank you, David. Turn, turn to Adam. Among Adam's responsibilities at J.P. Morgan is to think through how to navigate through both on the business front and the regulatory front uh, these issues and with regulators no doubt spending more time with he and his colleagues uh, he's had challenges to, to to get through it and do so in a way in which uh, confidence is still held in the institution so turn it to you adam thank you uh, confidence is obviously a very important thing um, we like to think that we managed and navigated the crisis relatively uh, well and hopefully that inspired confidence in in our management team <clears throat> I wanted to try to give you a little bit of insight as to why all these issues matter and how they course through our organization and then maybe comment on some of the other things that have uh, been said today, much of which I actually uh, agree with. Um, so uh, every month, um, uh, my chairman CEO has a meeting with the CEOs of each of his six business lines. And they go through their financial uh, 
uh, performance, uh, their risk performance, their control agenda, and a host of other things. As part of that analysis, uh, they are uh, meant to discuss how they're doing with respect to the amount of equity that is assigned to uh, their business line. Uh, and we have a, in our capital management process, uh, we have a, a methodology for assigning capital to each business, uh, which is based on, uh, in part, uh, risk-weighted asset calculations, uh, updated now for Basel III. Um, uh, economic risk capital, so we have our own independent measure of uh, the capital we need to support our activity. Um, uh, RWA stresses, uh, peer comparisons, our, ex our outlook and expected uh, losses and loan loss reserve coverage, uh, as well as the application of management judgment uh, for example, related to the need to support franchise value in, say, an asset management business or something like that. Um, so uh, each business gets a, a, an allocation of capital, uh, if you will, and it's translated into a, a core amount or equity capital only. It's not uh, reflective of any type of hybrid instruments that may be allowed by regulators. At the same time, we try to fully load the costs of funding uh, to each of those business lines uh, so that um, we, we give funding to assets and we give credit to business lines that generate uh, liabilities. And we try to do this based on market ob observable factors uh, and we make this <coughs> independent of structure, legal entity uh, or otherwise. Um, so these, these are key components, both the capital and the funding costs of line of business uh, performance review uh, analysis uh, and it's used, it really courses through the organization because uh, it flows uh, literally down to the loan officer who may be sitting with a CFO in the field who can, and they're talking about a credit facility and he can literally uh, call up the, the cost both of capital and funding for the type of facility uh, they're discussing. So this is it's almost real time in, uh, in its flow through the organization. It's the, the drivers of marginal pricing decisions, of uh, uh, pricing models, of portfolio uh, sales and acquisition uh, decisions. So uh, this is very, very important uh, throughout our organization and it creates a discipline uh, around uh, the financial awareness and regulatory awareness because uh, most of the time, virtually all of the time, uh, the regulatory requirements uh, exceed our assessment uh, of the risk, even though we believe we're applying um, highly rigorous methods to determine the risk. So uh, what is done in the regulatory sphere translates directly uh, into, the, into the banker uh, activity. So against that background, let me just talk a little bit about what I consider to be uh, the laboratory that we're in. And I think that's really uh, what it is. Uh, and many people have uh, uh, noted this. Um, so as a general matter, we are highly supportive of uh, higher capital requirements, stronger liquidity standards, or really the introduction of liquidity standards because we haven't had them uh, before in any formal way. Uh, certainly the elimination of the too big to fail uh, notion and we were big proponents of uh, Title II of Dodd-Frank which is meant to get at the resolvability of uh, f large financial institutions in an orderly way. To echo what Kevin said, uh, however, we've done a lot already. Um, 19 SCAP banks have raised actually $300 billion of uh, capital. Leveraged has been uh, reduced substantially. And if actually, the IMF has a great graph, uh, which I should have brought, which shows that US financial institutions are better capitalized and lower leveraged than, uh, than others around the world. Risky structures have been virtually eliminated. Uh, and importantly, we're now subject uh, to regular stress tests. Uh, including one we just went through to determine whether it was acceptable to repay dividends or not. Uh, but uh, also importantly, for our own purposes to be shared with regulators, we do stress tests on a quarterly basis uh, that 
captures the entire institution. Uh, and we're subject to review by the supervisors of those stress tests and have to respond to their comments and uh, requests for uh, enhancements. So we've, we've done a lot to uh, shore up the financial system uh, for, the, for the future. Against that background, now we have Basel III, which represents a huge increase in capital uh, requirements. And Mark touched on it, he, he, he explained it well. But if you think about it, um, you know, our, our Basel I uh, translation between Basel I and Basel III uh, is really where our, our, our Basel uh, III 7% requirement, which is the capital. Uh, the minimum capital standard plus the conservation buffer that uh, Mark talked about uh, it translates into double digits of Basel I capital requirements. So uh, that's nearly uh, three times, the uh, more than three times, the well-capitalized equity standard uh, in the United States, so under, under FIDICIA. So we've done a lot to increase the capital, and this includes the calibration, uh, deductions from capital, uh, the definition of capital. Market risk capital requirements have been increased uh, three to four times, depending on who you are and how you measure it. Counterparty risk capital increased sub, uh, substantially. And the conservation buffer uh, gets at the um, point that uh, starts to get at the point David commented on, which is the payout of, uh, of capital at the same time that really you probably should be conserving it so that if you trip the new high 7% standard, you have to automatically start conserving capital. So we've built that automatic mechanism. Um, so <clears throat> all of this, by the way, is uh, being done uh, against a playing field that is uh, uneven at best. And I think uh, we're not just going to get in that, into that a little bit. So one of the things that uh, we're, we're concerned about is how um, this laboratory, I don't think we understand yet the intersection of how capital liquidity and leverage uh, will, uh, will work together uh, in these new standards. We're telling banks to hold a lot more capital, uh, but we're requiring them to self-insure against systemic, uh, truly systemic panic type events as well as idiosyncratic uh, runs. Um, new incentives are being created, and banks, being economic animals, will be responsive to them. So, um, uh, you know, what, for example, what are the liquidity standards incenting us to do or telling us? They're saying, don't provide liquidity uh, backstops uh, in, the, in the financial system. Uh, they're saying, don't take wholesale deposits. Well, that's a primary function of what we do. Um, don't uh, buy anything but governments. You know, no, nothing, and Mark didn't go into a whole lot of detail, but really government securities are the only thing that counts in the liquid asset buffer. And I think, um, you know, our, our sense, even through the crisis, if you go look at, at the numbers, um, there are plenty of liquidity in lots of asset classes besides governments. <clears throat> Banks will adjust their balance sheets to the increased capital requirements. Uh, and the new liquidity standards, and some will do so in very uh, meaningful, important ways. Um, the changes will be fast. Uh, I know the Basel Committee puts a lot of stock into the glide path to the implementation of the standards. Uh, we, Mark talked about the observation period. Um, that will not happen. Uh, banks will respond as soon as the ink appears to be dry, they will be responsive uh, to that and start managing that way. We are already starting to manage to Basel III standards. Um, I know uh, others will say, uh, um, you know, there's, there's no cost to, to equity. Well, not, Annette and team will talk about that later. Um, I think David's answer to that question was, was right. Uh, the market determines that. I think you, you know, those who think that ought to go talk to equity investors as we do. They do not think that there's no cost to uh, significantly higher capital requirements, uh, and they vote with their feet. And uh, we think that's very, very important. It's not clear at all that the cost of equity, uh, will, we will be rewarded with a reduction in the, the risk premium uh, whatsoever. And we're creating new incentives uh, along the way, including uh, to take higher, potentially higher risks in order to achieve uh, meaningful returns. <clears throat> 
Um, I think the answer in the end is a, is a balance, as David said. Uh, we're highly supportive of, of tough, uh, transparent, consistently applied and reasonable standards. And what we want is not to lose the benefits of a global financial system in an increasingly global and interdependent uh, economic world. Let me just find, uh, conclude if I have a minute, uh, Kevin, less than that. Just on the netting point, um, you know, netting, uh, netting works. And it is a true representation of uh, the credit and liquidity position of the firm. Uh, Lehman, uh, it, it proved to be the case in Lehman, there are four disputes around Lehman. None of them have to do with uh, closeout netting. So um, it's a fair representation of what the uh, economics are of a derivative trade, which, by the way, provides substantial value, as many have noted uh, in our economy. Thank you. Th thank you, Adam. Uh, turn to Raphael, who's going to take us through a few slides. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for the invitation uh, to be here. Um, I want to talk about uh, Basel III, and uh, you may be surprised to hear that perhaps uh, Basel III needs some fixing. Uh, it hasn't been born. And I, I want to start with uh, two quotations from the Financial Times. The first one is uh, coming from a letter of uh, Commissioner Barnier, who is the person in charge of financial markets in the European Union, to Secretary Geithner. He says, the U speed up uh, and toughen its new banking rules in order to prevent American banks from having an unfair advantage over their European counterparts. Well, kind of uh, strong words. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at this side of the Atlantic, uh, there is also another uh, quotation. European banks have a subjectivity of the risk weighting system with aggressive risk calculations. This comes from Jamie Dimon, uh, Adam's boss. Uh, and, 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 and actually, this, this is the same concern that David Vineyard expressed this morning about uh, level playing field issues. Uh, so what's going on? Uh, well, I think that uh, part of the reason is that the US didn't implement Basel II, and it's not clear what will eventually happen with Basel III. And the EU did implement Basel II, and uh, there is a draft directive for Basel III, but in a way that, as I will explain, leaves much to be desired. So what I'm going to do here today is to look at this uh, trust and lacting debate on Basel III from an academic perspective and focusing on capital requirements. I guess that I could say something about liquidity risk requirements, but I will, uh, don't have the time to do that. I want to argue that uh, uh, the issue of pro-cyclicality is, is at the core of uh, the problem. Uh, you may think that pro-cyclicality is a boring macro side effect, but I think that pro-cyclicality is very important, and in particular the way in which it has or it has not been addressed by supervisors. I want to talk about what's happened with risk-weighted assets uh, in, in, in recent years, and I want to have a brief comment about the counter-cyclical capital buffer of uh, Basel III. To start with, uh, something that everybody knows, uh, the structure of capital requirements, you have uh, capital over risk-weighted assets have to be greater than or equal to a minimum, so there are three elements in this formula. The numerator, what do we mean by capital? The denominator, how do we compute the risk weights? And of course, the minimum, uh, how large should the ratio be? Now, the proposals of Basel III have already been uh, uh, described or summarized by uh, Mark. Uh, uh, on the numerator, we will have a more restricted definition of uh, common equity. The denominator, we have higher weights for trading assets and structured products. And we have already seen what's uh, going to happen to the minimum requirements. Now, what else is in Basel III, just to, uh, for reference? Well, there is a leverage ratio. There are the liquidity risk uh, requirements. And then there is this counter-cyclical capital buffer that I will try to make uh, a brief comment. Now, what's the pro-cyclicality problem? Well, I mean, what happens in downturns uh, under risk sensitive regulation is that banks' capital is eroded by losses. Uh, Non-defaulted borrowers uh, get downgraded. And of course, uh, this should lead to an increase in risk weighted assets, which increases, of course, capital requirements. So if raising fresh external capital in bad times is difficult, then banks will be forced to uh, cut back on their lending. And this will lead to this uh, amplification of uh, business cycle fluctuations. Something similar also happens in good times. So um, uh, let me quote Charles Goodhart in a recent paper in the Journal of Economic Literature. Uh, Add to the pro-cyclicality of Basel II the increased adoption of mark-to-market -market accounting, and you have a perfect doomsday machine for exacerbating leverage cycles. I want to come back to this perfect doomsday machine. And um, so let's look at the behavior of risk-weighted assets over the last few years. 
Well, capital requirements uh, are supposed, were supposed to be risk sensitive, especially under Basel II, so therefore especially in Europe. So let's, uh, I want to look at the ratio of risk weighted assets to total assets for a sample of banks in Europe, uh, the UK, Switzerland, and, and the US. I guess that, I mean, my, uh, pre uh, my, my intuition said that, uh, well, risk weighted assets over assets should have increased dramatically during the crisis, but look at what's happened. This is for the uh, banks in the Eurozone. Well, uh, well the, the, the banks here are Deutsche Bank, Societe Generale, uh, BNP Paribas, uh, Commerce Bank, uh, I think it's the Italian uh, Unicredit and Santander. Well, I mean, could you, I mean, look at 2008. I mean, if anything, it came down, uh, the ratio of risk weighted assets over total assets. The QK is, is similar, nothing there, really. Uh, uh, the Swiss banks are the ones with the lowest. Uh, I guess that uh, Wilson will say something about this. Uh, Wilson, your bank is the red one here. Uh, they are, I mean, look at the numbers. They go from zero to 90%. And, and I, I've taken the average. Uh, these are the US banks, which are much higher. And uh, yours is the green one, um, JP Morgan. And, and I've taken the regional averages doing the uh, weighted by the assets. And uh, well, you can see here that uh, US is at the top, although some people tell me that this is because of uh, some accounting uh, netting things. And the Swiss banks are the, at the bottom. And, uh, but the, I mean, I guess the private sector people worry very much about the cross-sectional differences in these uh, uh, ratios. I'm, I'm concerned about the time series behavior, the fact that you couldn't tell from here that something big has happened uh, in the last few years. Uh, during the first worst financial crisis since the Great Depression, the ratio has remained stable. So the perfect doomsday machine that Charles Goodhart was referring to was not perfect at all. So, how can we account for this? Well, there may be some portfolio reallocation uh, to our safer assets, but I think that the most likely explanation I th is the fact that uh, a lot of these uh, banks uh, were using through the cycle approaches to uh, get these internal ratings. And these, uh, these are unconditional uh, assessments of risk uh, uh, based on an ideal average point of uh, the business cycle. And these uh, unconditional assessments uh, were accepted and even encouraged by supervisors. Now, what's the problem with through the cycle approaches? Well, basically, nobody knows what it exactly means. Uh, it, it, it are, it, they are applied differently by different banks and jurisdictions. They open the door to excessive supervisory discretion, and certainly they uh, introduce this uh, risk of unlevel playing field. Also, they violate the usage test requirement of Basel to, uh, through the cycle ratings, ignore material and relevant information, so they are not useful for pricing and risk management. So um, they are a disaster, basically. Uh, and, and, and since uh, you didn't have uh, the way to adjust uh, the capital requirements for the cycle, uh, then, of course, uh, the only way was to do this uh, cheating. Now, how about uh, uh, the counter-cyclical buffer, which is this new invention that uh, Basel III has introduced in order to take care of the cyclical behavior? Well, uh, this is an extension of the capital conservation buffer. It's an additional 2.5% of risk-weighted assets. Uh, and the problem with the counter cyclical buffer is that the Basel Committee has chosen as the common reference point for taking the buffer decision, something called the credit to GDP gap, which is like the output gap, but with uh, credit to GDP ratios. What's the problem with the counter cyclical buffer? Well, I mean, if you look at how it correlates with business cycle like GDP growth, in most countries you have a negative correlation. So that means that the gap would signal to reduce capital in good times and would signal to increase capital in bad times. Now, so, so this is a complete disaster. Uh, uh, so uh, I have here some correlations using IMF data. Uh, the average for all these uh, six countries is, 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 is minus 0.1 uh, of the gap. The second column is a correlation of the buffer that you construct from the gap is uh, also negative. If you take the World Bank data, then uh, you have even stronger negative correlations. And here for the US is, uh, is, is negative. Uh, uh, and this is for the data comprising the 2009 uh, year. So uh, I have a picture. This is uh, what uh, in the UK, which is the, one of the ones, one of the countries for which this uh, negative correlation is, 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 is stronger. Uh, 
And, and you can see the red line is GDP growth, uh, the blue line is the credit to GDP gap, and you see the credit to GDP gap peaks in 2008 and 2009. So this is where you're telling banks to build more buffers at the time where you're supposed to be uh, releasing those buffers to, to accommodate the state of the cycle. So um, what would be the alternative approach? Uh, well, I, I've written a paper with uh, two of my former students uh, proposing to import the idea of automatic stabilizers. Uh, the idea is to use point-in-time uh, ratings to compute the requirements and then use a multiplier scaling factor to, uh, based on GDP growth to adjust for the cycle. The multiplier would be greater than one in expansion, would be smaller than one in recessions, and in that way you could try to ameliorate the impact of the business cycle. So let me just conclude with a few comments. Uh, uh, I think that Mark is the only person on, of the Basel Committee here, so this Mark, these are for you to take. Uh, first, uh, it's about what should the Basel Committee do? Well, I think that the Basel Committee should explicitly abandon through the cycle approaches. A point in time, I think, is the only hope for Basel III, in particular, the only hope to sort out the level playing field issue. Second comment, I think that you do explicitly abandon uh, the credit to GDP gap uh, and look for an alternative reference, uh, 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 common reference without these negative side effects. Third, I think that you should introduce uh, a business cycle adjustment to the minimum requirements. This is something that was pending in the Basel III and uh, possibility, if nothing better comes uh, to mind, use this uh, uh, multiplier based on GDP growth. Uh, I have three more. Uh, uh, um, I think that the Basel Committee should stop conducting its work in silos. Uh, the different risks and the different regulations are not independent. You have a group of people working on liquidity regulation as if liquidity had nothing to do with capital, and, and then you have the counter-cyclical people doing this work without looking at what would be the implication with respect to business cycle. This is a terrible situation. I think that you should get together and try to put things under the same uh, uh, analysis. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the Basel Committee should seriously engage academics. Uh, I think that uh, there are... There are many problems with Basel III. You have basically ignored them. Perhaps uh, some of them are very vocal, not necessarily friendly, but uh, you, they are your only hope. And finally, <laughs> and finally, I think that at this point, we should put the US in the driver's seat. I think that uh, the chair of the Basel Committee is going to be appointed in the next few weeks. I think that uh, uh, there is this risk of uh, U.S. drifting apart. You have here Dot Frank and all the uh, duties that this require. I think that uh, uh, this is a time where uh, the U.S. should be put uh, you know, in command of this. And, uh, and remember that I'm a European uh, on this, uh, but, but I think that this is... They're going to let you back. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, but this is badly needed. So I, I urge Mark to convey this to your bosses that this is the time to make a bid for, for the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Raphael. So we have uh, two microphones, just as before. Um, you can direct your questions to individual members of the panel, or you can put them out there, and I'll try to sh share them broadly. As people are getting the microphone, why don't I start with a question for my colleagues? Um, and if you can line up behind the microphones to follow me. So at a place like Stanford, we'd probably begin this debate by saying, well, what's the framework for prudential supervision? How should we be governed? And I think in that framework, we'd say, well, there should be three pillars. There should be regulatory discipline that would play an important role, and much of the discussion today has been about that. There's capital standards, and that's a second pillar, and that should play a very important role, and much of the discussion today is about that. Now let me add the third pillar, which I think Adrian will take up with some discomfort market discipline. Now, over the crisis, I think what we found is that regulatory discipline fell down. Capital standards, capital regulation fell down. And yes, in fact, market discipline fell down. But much of the discussion today has been about how do I fix those two pillars as if the suggestion is, you know, you can never trust those markets again. Well, we didn't say that about regulators and we didn't say that about capital. So is, for, I'll ask my uh, colleagues up here, is there a role for market discipline? Should information about the banks be more understood by uh, stakeholders so that they can help police firms? So they, instead of treating the US banks as one entity, can tier them and say, I like the risk reward of this 
bank, but I don't like the other? Or have we decided that market discipline has lost its place at the table? Maybe we can start with you, Adrian, and we'll do a quick round here before we take outside questions. Well, I think that's a, that, that's a I mean, I think I tried to say, maybe I was rushing, but the, the main proposal that we made at the OECD has been uh, for this idea of separation, that, uh, that retail and commercial banking, uh, which is the subject of explicit and implicit guarantees, shouldn't be uh, um, in the same box as various functions to do with, uh, uh, let's call them investment banking functions for, for shorthand. Uh, so if you separate those off, uh, then uh, market discipline comes to its fore. For example, if I'm setting up a dealer relationship with Goldman's and, uh, and they wanted to uh, um, put me uh, uh, you know, with some shelf company in the Cayman Islands with $10 capital, you know, the back office says, no, we won't touch that. We want access to Goldman's. But if you actually did that and said, actually, the entity you're dealing with is separate from Goldman's, it's uh, separately capitalized, then of course, the bid ask spread is going to be what? Of course, it's going to be much more, of course, the cost of capital is going to go up. But my question would be, is that a wrong thing? And uh, my, uh, my, my sort of opponent on the, uh, on, on the desk, he would say, but that makes it much harder for us to manage our, across, uh, across you know, the banks, uh, you know, all the different activities we do. If you separate things off, it makes it more complicated. But the objective, of, ma of separation isn't to make it more comfortable for, uh, you know, for people to do their jobs in risk management. The, exist the question really is, is to, make it, um, to make it such that the cost of capital that you face is the true cost of capital and there's no cross subsidization from deposit insurance, implicit guarantees, too big to fail and so on. You shouldn't be implicitly putting that into your uh, cost of capital for other parts of the business. So separation is exactly uh, what gives you proper market discipline. I'm very happy for the private sector to do it, but not when there's cross subsidization too big to fail, uh, retail banking and so on has to be separated from that. So Adrian was looking at me, but he was talking to you, Adam. What say you? I'm going to hit my boomerang. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, don't, I don't think separation is what would achieve the desired market discipline. Uh, um, I believe that would make our financial institution much more opaque, not less, uh, since transparency is obviously one of the issues that people have talked about enhancing market discipline. Uh, I think it's wrong to say that we're not in this. It's OK to make life more difficult for the management of risk within an institution. That's precisely the opposite of what we want uh, to intend. As far as cross-subsidiarization, uh, you know, the retail business pays for deposit insurance, but now in the United States, the wholesale business pays for deposit insurance because it's based on total liabilities, uh, not on deposits. So uh, I think there's a lot to refute what, what, that it, what um, Adrian has to say there. If you want to enhance uh, market discipline, I think there's a, we think there's a, a very important role for that. I think disclosure uh, is absolutely critical to that. You know, banks' annual reports, quarterly reports, run into the hundreds of pages. Uh, there's a lot of information there. Uh, some of it's driven by um, the accounting standards setters and the securities regulators, not necessarily useful. I think it's important for bank management in their uh, interaction with the marketplace, whether it's through earnings calls or uh, conferences or meetings with uh, rating agencies uh, to try to make them as transparent uh, as possible. There's lots of debt uh, issued by financial institutions in which the market can um, vote with its feet. Okay. Let, let's turn to questions. I think my cue here is now a word from our sponsor. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> Sound like uh, selling GE refrigerators. Um, Paul Salzman from the Clearinghouse. Uh, a question in the context of the um, uh, anticipated or proposed uh, surcharges on CIFIs or GCIFIs. And the question I have for the panel um, is, uh, is it premature to impose additional capital requirements on CIFIs or GCIFIs when it's pretty clear that no one really understands the cumulative impact of the already uh, uh, put in place reforms that are meant to address too big to fail, let alone uh, Basel III capital and liquidity requirements in and of themselves. So if the panel could comment on the cumulative impact of all the reforms and its effect on the banking sector and the global economy in the context of the proposed sort of uh, surcharges, both the uh, existence of a surcharge and the degree or quantity of any surcharge. Thank you. 
So maybe I'd direct that question, David, for you. Uh, Moody's obviously has a critical role to play here in thinking about whether the capital standards we've talked about um, should be supplemented for the institutions that are deemed in the language of the moment to be systemically significant. For those in the audience, I think one of the theories behind the global surcharge is that the largest institutions are whether, no matter how well their risk management procedures, that perhaps they are taking bigger risks. Perhaps they are, there are negative externalities that need to be accounted for, so the insurance cushion should be higher. David, what says Moody's on the subject? Um, so many different parts to this one. So yes, uh, there are certain institutions that are systemically important. Uh, they, in fact, the numbers that were bailed out in number of institutions that were bailed out during the crisis far exceeded our expectations going into the crisis. Um, from a social policy perspective, which is not something Moody's ever comments on, uh, there can be an argument made for a higher buffer. Certainly, the extent that there is efforts underway to <coughs> Uh, imp implement resolution powers and take actions that rather than that in the context of bailout would impose losses on creditors, then we will need to lower our support assumptions. Some SIFI buffer for such firms increasing their capital position could potentially help to offset. So if in, in rating speak, the standalone rating might go up at the same time that the supported rating goes down. That would limit the downward pressure, but probably would still be some downward pressure because um, it's, of all the other factors I cited, you know, it's not clear how you measure the SIFI buffer or what's the right SIFI buffer. And now let me make clear, we don't identify what the right number is, so that's the beauty of ratings, it's relative ranking. I mean, we do have to peg that relative ranking to our default scale, and that, so that in some sense, yes, there is a, a rightness to that buffer, but um, our ratings are a relative ranking of risk, so by that definition, higher capital is going to be better, but it, it can't be viewed in isolation, and that's the challenge we face, everyone faces, as everyone knows, but capital is one answer, it's not the only answer, capital for a you know, domestic retail deposit taking local lending bank is very different than capital for a big global markets bank with significant wholesale funding exposures. Um, and so, but these things can't be are very hard boiled yeah, down to one this number. Question. I think the other element which we have been ignoring is there is the political element you can't ignore. So people are striking while the iron is hot because that iron is cooling very fast. Um, I've been amazed at how much already the iron is cooling. Um, and so that complicates the whole situation quite dramatically and makes it difficult to conduct laboratory experiments. Raphael, let me redirect this question to you. So as someone who was pretty critical of where the Basel III process is, does that suggest that the question about adding a surcharge to a weak foundation is ill-timed, or is now the time to get it all fixed? Well, um, I, I, I made a presentation at the Bank of England last week in which I referred to the original scene of Basel II. And the original scene is that there is no economics there, in the sense that the regulation is not based on some sort of cost-benefit analysis of what are the, uh, the, the impact of these. Uh, now, uh, I am not uh, an expert on, on sort of uh, CFIs, and I haven't thought about that. My hunch is that uh, if you look at the costs, social costs, which are uh, associated with the failure of one of these large uh, systemic institutions, then that suggests that perhaps there should be a surcharge uh, for them but uh, I don't have any idea about the magnitude, and certainly I don't know what uh, Paul was referring to, the cumulative impact of all those regulations, because the package has not been designed in a sort of uh, uh, global way. It's, it's sort of, we don't know. I mean, uh, I mean, for some banks, perhaps these liquidity risk requirements are going to be terrible, and uh, so I don't know. Yeah, Adrian wants to jump in here, then we'll take another question. Just, just really quickly, I, I think that the question is no. Uh, it's not too early to be doing it. And the reason is, is because uh, Basel, uh, with the, the, port, the, assumption, the basic assumption of Basel is portfolio invariance, uh, which is like a linear additive kind of thing, which doesn't penalize concentration. Uh, we're talking here about, and, and let me tell you, the debate that is on this very subject is about the question of uh, how do you sort of get the eyes of so, the notion of size and concentration and interconnectedness. That, that's the technical difficulty of having one. But the idea that we shouldn't have one now because it's got somehow covered when we have a system where portfolio invariance is the assumption, uh, to me, it, there's definitely the time to have it because you can have a buffer on uh, the question of concentration uh, and interconnectedness if we can define what that is. 
So I think the summary from uh, this panel, and I think the question is, uh, reminds me of the old saw. Um, they, were, they asked the person at the restaurant what they think. The person at the restaurant said, the food here is terrible and the portions are too small. Next question. Just re returning again to the, the question of too big to fail, and uh, I'd love to hear the differing perspectives from, not from Adam and Adrian necessarily, but from Adam and, and David. So Adam, you, you, taught, you extolled the virtues of, uh, of Dodd-Frank Title II and, and talking about how, if I understood you correctly, it, it eliminated the too big to fail problem for, for the SIFIs. I'm intrigued by this in light of the fact, I'm not as familiar with Moody's own, own ratings of the SIFIs as I am with Standard & Poor's, but that uh, Standard & Poor's has made an explicit reference to the implicit guarantees when, uh, when evaluating and rating the debt of, of these systemically important financial institutions. So the question is, uh, for Adam and, and also for David, is, is JP Morgan too big to fail? And if the answer is no, why do the rating agencies have that wrong in, in the ways that they evaluate that debt? And if the answer is yes, then could that be something that, that these uh, equity investors who would be so resistant to, to ratcheting up capital adequacy, would that be something that they would, would enjoy, those implicit guarantees, the, the subsidies from government that would make the equity investment uh, a much more uh, lucrative proposition for them? David should definitely answer that question <laughs> first. <laughs> um, we believe they are systemically important, and we incorporate two notches of uplift into our ratings, that, which are already quite high because they did demonstrate stronger risk management than many of their peers and maintained a stronger capital position than many of their peers. Um, it will be very difficult to resolve JP Morgan in a way that does not create massive systemic risk. Their role within clearing systems, multiple different clearing systems, not to mention the derivatives products, is enormous. And frankly, this is true for many large banks around the world. And to, to tease that all apart, to tease apart that interconnectedness in a way that can somehow resolve these institutions without creating massive contagion is extraordinarily challenging. I think most of us here understand that. I'm not talking, I'm not talking heresy. People understand these things. But the reality is it will be very difficult to implement. There are many, many things beyond just having a resolution power. Uh, including many of the other elements of Dodd-Frank, um, which may help, you know, um, significant restructuring of the organizations may be necessary, and through the resolution plans and living wills process to even get to the point where that could be done. Now, there's a lot of work on that being done, and we may move in that direction, but we still have, for us, as a rating agency, we still think there's a lot of uncertainty as to how successful this will all be. Um, nonetheless, we see downward pressure because the political rhetoric is very strong and the, the focus of, of authorities around the world is we don't want to pay for this a second time. Um, yeah. it's a, oh, and by it's the way, we were doing that, we've been incorporating that explicitly into our ratings for about three or four years. So. Yeah, I mean, it's a difficult situation, right? Because you don't want to prove you're not a witch by drowning, right? So. Um, you can stop and think about that for a minute. It, 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 you'll get it in a little while. Um, uh, David's exactly right, right. There's a ton of work going on through recovery uh, resolution, so-called living will processes now. We've done um, three submissions on this with our regulators. It's going to be iterative. There's much more to come. Uh, where we think about legal entity structure and how to simplify that. Um, so we run scenarios and uh, try to um, uh, war game, if you will, uh, situations of what would happen if um, you know, we had a certain series of events and that created uh, funding pressure on the firm, what we would do about it. Um, Recapitalization uh, proposals, uh, we've worked on uh, white papers, which we've shared with a number of regulators, uh, about how to recap a bank so that you don't necessarily uh, get to the point of you actually have to disentangle it. So um, yeah, we're, we're a large global uh, impor uh, important financial institution. Uh, we're proud of that. Um, and we're going to work um, with the regulatory community uh, on these very issues. Um, it's, it's not easy, but um, you know, the law of the land in the United States 
uh, requires us to move in that direction, and the intent is to make it so that banks are not uh, too big to fail. Next question, Wilson. Uh, my name is Wilson Irvin. I'm from Credit Suisse, so I guess I'm playing the role of the local Swiss banker. Um, <laughs> You talked for a little while about the low RWA to gross assets, and I want to explore that a little bit with the panel. Uh, some people have asserted this is a crazy Basel II calculation thing, and it's true, Basel II is a tough machine. It's about a quarter million calculations, so could anybody possibly understand it? <coughs> but interestingly, we had the same, roughly the same amount of capital in Basel I, and if you look at those graphs, they were about the same in Basel I. And Basel I, as I think Andy Haldane from the Bank of England pointed out, can be done by a competent clerk with an envelope and a pencil. So it does beg the question of what's going on here. I do think it's, as someone who ran risk for a long time, I think it's very important to risk weight assets. I think not doing that gets you into actually much bigger trouble than trying to do it. I think it's a necessary evil. If you don't do that, you're gonna end up with T-bills counting actually more than say a CDO swap. And that's just perverse. You need to align this better with markets, otherwise I think you get some very bad properties. So my question is, what could we do actually to make some of these calculations more comparable, more transparent, so that some of the pillar three aspects could be more visible to investors and we could actually bring uh, market discipline, which was one of the original goals of the Basel framework, into play more easily? And I just wonder if there are any ideas that the panel has to make that more transparent uh, to the users. Risk-weighted assets, anyone want to join in on that? Rafael, you were somewhat critical of the, of the judgments being yes. made. I, I, I agree with uh, Wilson and uh, that uh, risk-weighted assets are a necessary evil. Uh, you will hear this afternoon uh, a proposal to just get rid of uh, risk-weighted assets and just go to, uh, or forget about the weighting because there's no way in which you can do this uh, 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 foolproof. Um, the problem is how uh, you manage that, and I think that uh, uh, my point is that uh, the through the cycle approach, which is so popular uh, among supervisors, is, is very bad. Uh, unless you uh, put the risk weighting on a basis that uh, can be verified and replicated uh, in a simple way by outsiders, then this is going to be a black box that nobody will understand. So I think that there is a lot of work to be done by regulators, but there's also a lot of work to be done by the private sector in trying to sort of uh, look at how this is done, how it should be done, and perhaps agree some sort of common standards that uh, will allow this to go forward. Uh, Adrian wants to jump in, then we'll go to Adam and take the next question. Yeah, I think uh, I, yeah, I sort of don't agree with the premises of the question. Uh, I, I think that. Um, you know, the, the, the Basel system assumes that, you know, that there's this asset and that asset and, and the risk that it has came down from the mountains uh, with the stone tablets and, and, and that stays at that and that stays at and you risk weighted and voila. But in the world of complete markets, which now includes banking after, you know, the development of derivatives, we didn't have complete markets in the old days, but we do now. You can just shift. So, so what is the financial system? The financial system is just the system of promises. You go back to the Wild West days, you just write a promissory note. It's a system of promises. If you have a system where derivatives can be used to shift those promises around to wherever the lowest common denominator is, because we do not have a level playing field, if you can just shift the promises around, risk-weighted assets let you do that. And that's what they do. And that's why those graphs look like that. So shake your head, but that's the truth. Uh, it, to me, there's no such thing as ex ante buckets of risk, because you can always transform things. Uh, I just encourage you to actually look at the numbers for the actual banks in the world and check how those trends have been over time and when Basel II is implemented. Adam? Okay. Can I put it up? I was actually going to say something nice and agree with you. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> but, but, oh, too bad. Um, <laughs> actually, I think, I, actually, I will. So, to, again, to get at time. Wilson's, I try to get at Wilson's question. And I think uh, Daryl, uh, you and Gary Gordon may have done um, uh, some work that says, hey, it, it, capital may not be the best predictor of uh, distress here. In fact, it could, it's likely to be uh, a, le a lagging indicator. I think we saw that in um, the, the uh, financial crisis, of some of a lagging indicator. And that there are other measures that we ought to be looking at, Wilson, which might help us 
uh, here, and this is where Adrian, I can agree with you. I think concentration is an excellent point. You know, we see this all the time. Bank, why do banks fail largely? Because they get concentrated in a particular type of asset class, uh, and that blows up somehow, uh, and they can't withstand it because the market loses confidence. There goes their funding. The capital isn't there, and they're done. And I think that's a great point, and we should uh, we should definitely uh, look at that. Um, asset quality uh, measures ought to be scrutinized uh, intensively as predictors of financial performance. So I think there there are metrics out there. I think banks put a lot of information out there. Perhaps we can do a better job. We can maybe some academic research could be done about other predictive measures of uh, bank financial performance and risk performance. Um, to supplement uh, on capital. I don't know that you could ever actually get uh, Wilson through a pillar three type disclosure into the gory details of actually how um, you know a, a PD LGD was actually determined because it just it would be too much information to digest. So. Question, is there some way you could use some sort of standard testing portfolio or something? Yep, that like would that? be another way. Yeah, I think that's a good, um, and we've suggested that, I don't know if it's wrong, but we've suggested that in market risk in particular, uh, the advo we've advocated the use of test portfolios to get behind what are, how are models capturing the risk attributes of a particular portfolio. We think that's critical. It would be hugely informative to supervisors. They ought to use it as checks on each other for peer reviews. Uh, we'd be all in support of that. Let's take our next question. Yeah, I'm Jonathan Burke. I'm a professor here at GSB. One of the advantages of being a professor is you get to take a step back every now and again. So I'm going to ask you a question, which is really going you know, to force you guys to take a step back. The question is this. How can somebody earning $100,000 a year possibly regulate somebody earning $10 million a year? Let me give you some background. If you look at the, the, the discussion today, you will see all the regulators said essentially the same thing, which was there was a problem with the current regulation, and here's how you fix it. Ignoring the fact that when that current regulation was written, those very people were saying there was a problem with the previous regulation. Here's how we're going to fix it, and we're never going to have the problem again. Okay? And Adrian goes back, takes whatever you guys write, okay, and then figures out how to make the most amount of money he can, which inevitably, which inevitably, which inevitably leads to undermining the regulation. So let's go back to the question. How is it possible for people earning hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to regulate people earning $10 million a year? So it's a, it's a question that I think has been hanging over this group for a while. Um, let me invite my colleagues to jump into it. I would suggest that one answer is to not rely solely on the well-intentioned, good-faith wisdom of regulators alone to be the policeman. I would suggest that regulators need some means to look over the mountain around the corner, and one means to do that is to get market prices to start helping them. Market prices can't help them if people that are bidding on those prices think these institutions are effectively backed by their governments. So one mental exercise, as my colleagues get ready to answer this, is look at the 10K or 10Q in financial reports of a consumer products company. Look at the financial statements of Walmart or Procter & Gamble. Spend a couple of hours and see if you understand that business and what the risks are to them financially. Seems not an impossible task. Pull out the 10K or 10Q of a large, systemically significant financial institution in Japan, in Switzerland, in Germany, in France, in the US, and try that same exercise, even with the expertise in this room, and you end up with a far less un clear understanding. And in so doing, markets are perhaps not helping regulators look around the corners as best they could. But I turn it to my colleagues to try to answer that question. Raphael, should we start with you? Yeah, well, I think that this is not unique to banking and banking regulation. Think of taxation. I mean, you have a corporate tax lawyer earning the 10 million, and uh, maybe you have the, the poor guy working at the Treasury or the IRS uh, trying to sort of uh, see through this. So, I mean, this is a, a broader thing related to uh, public sector and how it relates to the private sector. And I think that I agree with Kevin that there is, uh, uh, there is something that. Uh, 
can be said on, on, on his argument. But I would like to argue that uh, there is something called uh, sort of a public service. I think that's how people sort of like to spend their lives uh, in, in sort of uh, working in this type of field. And perhaps uh, we should rely more on this type of uh, ability of a willingness of people to do that kind of job. But uh, I, I don't have a good answer to your question. Adam? I, yeah. Um, look, David and I were, were uh, classmates uh, together. And we went to the, the Fed uh, together in, in New York after graduate school precisely for that reason. We were interested in public service. Uh, and we didn't think we were, uh, well, at least in, in David's case, he was as smart as any banker that was out there, definitely not in my case. But his, in his case, uh, you know, he was committed to public service. There are high quality people uh, in regulatory agencies. Um, they're not unlike any other uh, corporate type entity where you have a distribution of talent. And, um, you know, I, I don't think it's purely a, a matter of money. You have very dedicated people who are uh, committed to that endeavor. Is it a challenge? Yes. I think cross-pollinization would be good. Having regulators come in, actually spend some time in a financial institution, and go then look at another one to avoid conflicts. I think that's, uh, I know in France they've tried that. I think that's a very good uh, uh, discipline. Um, but I, I don't think it's a purely a matter of numbers. You have institutional uh, frameworks. You have you know well-intentioned and well-thought-out people. I, I have a question for for you in return. Like, how do I get to wear jeans and a tucked-out shirt to an event like this? <laughs> you, uh, That's very good. You, well you, you get tenure at Stanford. <laughs> <All right. laughs> okay. um, well, and I, let me ask you this: It's funny that this was your response because I guarantee you, on the compensation committee at Morgan, you would never argue that. You would never argue, well, we rely on the fact that people are publicly spirited towards Goldman, towards uh, J.P. Morgan. We would, we, 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 it's not, the, you know, it's nice to think about people as being publicly spirited. And it's nice to think that we all act the way we do, but we know that fundamentally people aren't motivated that way on, you know, at, at a very base level. So when you've got a, somebody earning a couple hundred thousand and somebody earning 10 million, we know where the incentives, the person with the 10 million has all the incentives to work really, really hard, and worse than that, to hire the very best brains to undermine whatever regulations were written. I think if we just proceed with it, saying, well, that doesn't happen, hmm. that people don't behave that way, no, I, I think I, that's how we get I don't to think where I we was are. Saying, I don't think I was saying that. I think that uh, all I was saying is that for, for the pay that the Federal Reserve pays, which is very good relative to society in general. They're very competent, strong people. There's an institutional framework that supports them. Um, there are laws and regulation that provide the foundation for what they do. Uh, could they improve their talent? Absolutely. Would it be better if they had more money to pay people to attract as rich talent as they could? Yeah, that would be helpful too. But it's not like they're without talent or with, they're, out, they're in, unable to do uh, their, their jobs. I, I just. I don't find that. Adrian wants to get in quickly. Then uh, we've got three minutes. We'll try to do lightning round questions. Go ahead. Well, I, I, I think I, I sort of agree with your question entirely, uh, or the, the sense of it. I, I think uh, you know when you've got uh, uh, every, for everyone, go for the gold is always a part of their lifetime objective. And, and unfortunately, um, regulatory capture. One of the elements of regulatory capture is that uh, the person on the hundred k is always through his career, in a sense, taking a job interview for when he transfers across to go for the gold. Uh, and that makes it very, very hard uh, uh, in, in that process. We've got time for two final quick questions. We'll start here. Yeah, I, my question is in two parts. One has to do with uh, to what extent, oh, my name is Monib Kadami with Cypress Praxis. How do you account for uh, public confidence and trust in uh, what you do? And number two, uh, it, this is again related to this business of uh, the banking sector and finance sector is supposed to from uh, Professor Horn's class, uh, allocate uh, capital and savings to the real world and real economy. So to some degree, I mean, the whole focus has got to be on how we do in the real economy and the extent to which the incentive for bankers has gotten, I mean, from the perspective of some of us, skewed, where the incentives don't have much to do with the real economy but have more to do with the banking and finance sector. So people who are involved in the finance sector basically get a lot more in compensation 
that teachers and uh, people who provide labor and who provide real goods and services to most people. So um, this is not directly to what you're talking about, but it's really the bigger context for what we do in an institution to be able to push some back in terms of our existing points of view and see if any of them loosen. So that's the second part of my question. It has to do with whether you are uh, aware, whether you agree, whether you question among yourselves, whether the banking and finance sector has an inordinately greater amount of power in society, in our political system, even in the regulatory environment, uh, as well as in our economy. Anyone want to try to do that quickly? <laughs> I think those are both tough and hard questions. Adrian promises he can answer them both soundly in 30 seconds. We're going to take a final question here after that. Well, just quickly, the, the, you know, the fundamental uh, assets that I spoke of in that, that gray line, uh, that funds real activity uh, and investment. You saw that uh, you know, the derivatives, which accounts for a lot of uh, remuneration and, uh, and, and employing people, has been growing exponentially over time. Uh, let's just say that that period from 1998 till today isn't a period that covers itself with glory in terms of economic growth in the real economy. Great, final question. Very, very quick then. Moody's just threatened to lower US government's rating if debt ceiling and presumably related issue of deficit wasn't handled. What do you all think? How serious is this? It was directed, it's a qu question about the uh, forthcoming debt limit directed at our Moody's colleagues. We put, special, we put out a special comment yesterday. I haven't had actually, actually had a chance to discuss it with my sovereign colleagues. Um, so I'm going to pass on that. But I, certainly we've been pretty consistent in what we've been saying, which is the US government has a deficit challenge. Uh, many developed countries do. Uh, the US government needs to address that challenge. The short-term issues about the debt ceiling are um, uh, just heighten that challenge. But frankly, if a government decided for whatever reason to default on its obligations, even on a temporary basis, then we would need to reflect that in the ratings. Presumably everybody else on the panel has been thinking about this particular issue too, so I wonder if we could hear your general thoughts on debt ceiling, US deficit, lowering ratings, what this might do to what you all do. So I'm looking at the look of my colleagues here, and they feel ill-prepared to answer that. But, uh, but, but uh, we appreciate those two final questions. Those are both, frankly, worthy of panel discussions, both with respect to the fiscal sustainability of uh, the economy in the U.S., the costs and obligations associated with the financial crisis that have no doubt added to the burdens that the last question spoke to, as well as, I think, a broader question that was raised about whether the time and attention and financial resources that have gone into the financial services sector is bearing fruits on the real side of the economy. With that, uh, let me, on behalf of all of you, thank my colleagues for joining me today.